Well, if you would tonight, take your Bibles and join me in turning to Ezra 9 while I breathe, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Ezra chapter 9 tonight. I thank Brother Reem for his ministry, not only playing for me, but in leading the ensemble. He's done a wonderful job in uh, training these young people. I was talking to a woman in the service last night, and she said, I wish our church choir would sound like that. And I said, well, if you practice four or five hours a week like these kids did, maybe you would. I said, they, they have to go to class, and they practice, and they practice, and they practice. But it's a joy to be with you tonight and to be able to remind you a little bit about the ministry of Ambassador Baptist College. Our school was started in 1989 by evangelist Ron Comfort for the purpose of training men and women for full-time Christian service. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not an alarmist. I'm a pretty level-headed fellow, but I'm going to tell you something tonight. There is a shortage of preachers in America. That's right. And the reason I know that is I'm reminded every week, I'm reminded every week when churches across this country call us saying, can you recommend men? Do you have graduates that can come and preach the word to us? And uh, there's a great need. And that's the heartbeat of our school is training people for the ministry. We are unapologetically a Bible college. That's right. Now, we're a Christian college, but we're a Bible college. And let me tell you wherein the difference is. When a student goes to a Christian liberal arts school and they get a Bible degree, they usually get about 32 hours of Bible. One of the things that burdened Brother Comfort's heart many years ago was that uh, when, uh, when the Moody Bible Institute, the Moody Bible Institute was started in the early 1900s, do you know how much Bible somebody had when they left the doors of that place? More than 90 hours wow. of Bible. And Brother Comfort said, you know, I really think that if we're going to get back to training people in the ministry like we need to, we need to make the Bible the core curriculum. Amen. And that's why we take our students from Genesis to Revelation book by book in the classroom. In all of our four-year majors, uh, it's a ministry emphasis for the men, pastoral studies, evangelism, missions, music, and youth ministries for the ladies. Now, we don't train them to do the preaching, but they can marry the preachers if they want. And uh, they study Christian elementary education, church ministries, missions, and music. And then we also offer a three-year Bible degree and a one-year Bible certificate. One of the reasons we're here tonight is that we're looking for the next generation of Christian workers. We're looking for the next generation of school teachers, preachers, preachers' wives, missionaries, evangelists. And uh, we're also looking for people who have a heartbeat to see them train and have a burden that can join us in seeing the next generation train for full-time Christian service. Our school this year, we have students from about 30 different states, three or four foreign countries. Uh, we're a family atmosphere. It's one of the things I love about the school is you don't get lost in the crowd, so to speak. And uh, we have experienced faculty members that are training people for the ministry. Uh, Brother Comfort did not want people who had just gotten a master's degree to go right back into the classroom to teach somebody how to do something that they themselves had never done before. Right. Now, that doesn't make a lot of good common sense, does it? <laughs> Now, there's not a person in here that wants to be operated on by a surgeon who was taught by somebody who'd never done it. Right. And if you do, more power to you is what I have to say. But you know, the Bible pattern is Paul's training Timothy's, Elijah's training Elisha's, and we've gotten away from that. Right. And so our heartbeat at Ambassador is training God's servants for God's service. And I hope you will join me in praying that the Lord will raise up more laborers for the harvest. There's a great need. And everywhere I go, our young people are down right now with your young people, with your teenagers, encouraging them in the service of the Lord. You know, some people tell me, they say, Brother Bill, you just think that every teenage boy ought to be a preacher and every teenage girl ought to marry a preacher. And I tell them, listen, I really don't believe that because if I did, I'd probably have nobody to preach to. But I will tell you this, everybody ought to be willing. And I really believe that if that hurdle was crossed and our youth groups across this country, we could see a flood Amen. of people who hear God's call and go into the ministry. So I invite you to go to our website at ambassadors.edu. Be sure to put the S on the end of that, ambassadors.edu. And if you'll go there to our college website, you can watch our chapel services live 10 a.m., Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And uh, you can see what's going on, learn more information about the school. People can even apply online. 
And uh, so that's a great tool for you to be able to keep up with the school and to learn more about it. There are items on the table after the service tonight. I encourage you to go by. If there's one, if you only get one item off the table, the one item I would encourage you to get is our ambassador prayer card. I'll be standing back there after the service. I'd love to put one in your hands. Everywhere you, in your house, put it on the refrigerator or wherever you see regularly. And remember to pray for us. And there's also some Christian helps that are on the back table. Uh, Dr. Ron Comfort, our chancellor, wrote his, bi- his autobiography of Fire in My Bones. And I don't have the time to tell you all about it tonight, but basically it's this. How that God took a little baby that was six months old, held over a balcony by his mother, who was about to drop him. How God took a baby from six months old on the verge of being killed to saving him in Asheville, North Carolina in an evangelistic crusade and eventually calling him to preach the gospel and preach the gospel all over the world. It's a great story. And when I finished, re- when I finished reading it, I didn't think it was nearly as much about Ron Comfort as much as it was about the grace of God. And it would be a great encouragement to you tonight. Great story, a lot of details about his life that I didn't even know until I read it for the first time. Uh, also, there's some music items on the table. There's one uh, recording that I have back there. It's called Nearer, Still Near. And I think it has Ship Ahoy, 10,000 Angels, Follow Me, and other songs that we've commonly sung in revival meetings through the years. So see myself or see one of the students after the service, and we'd be glad to help you with that. And I hope that you'll pray for us as we train God's servants uh, for God's service. Pastor, thank you for letting us come. This meeting was a little bit on a short notice. Uh, we had an opening come up, and Pastor so graciously allowed us to come. And uh, we got here a little bit late. This Florida traffic, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Uh, This is a real baptism by fire for me. The town that I live in is 488 people. (laughs) The nearest town is 20,000 people, Shelby, which is only 10 minutes away. But uh, we have tractor jams, but not traffic jams in where I live. And so it's a little bit busier around here. Ezra chapter 9 tonight, I hope you found it. When Pastor first told me about uh, his request, I thought, Lord, Ezra? And, uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, there could have been some other books. He could have asked me to preach from the genealogies of Chronicles, and I would have had a hard time doing that. So I thought, Ezra, that'll be okay. But tonight I hope that I can be just another step along as you journey through the Bible this year. And really, when you get to the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, you see that God is in the midst of doing a great thing. Now, I want to give you a little bit of introduction, and I'm full aware that it's part of the message time for those of you that are keeping time, but I feel like to do it justice this evening, that's important for you to understand what's happening in the nation of Israel. Israel, at this point in the book of Ezra, is basically experiencing somewhat of a nationwide revival. And what I mean by that is the temple that Solomon built and all of its glory was destroyed... And Israel had been delivered into bondage, and now Israel is seeing that temple rebuilt. All right, that's a big deal. Uh, And if you don't think it's a big deal, take a trip to Israel and go to the Temple Mount, and even to this day, you find it the most revered site in all of Jerusalem. It's also the most contested. But one day, uh, we will see who really owns it, And uh, we'll see that the Lord Jesus certainly will have the upper hand on the Temple Mount. But the temple has just been rebuilt, but it is not in all of the splendor and all of the glory of Solomon's day. When Solomon built it, he went all out. And now this has been rebuilt, but I'm going to tell you, the nation of Israel, they're so excited the fact that this temple has been rebuilt. And that's the first half of the book of Ezra. You see a revival in the sense that the temple is being rebuilt. Now, what we're dealing with in the last half of Ezra is where not only did God rebuild a people or God rebuild a temple, but now you're going to see that God is rebuilding a people. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You know, sometimes it's harder to rebuild people than it is buildings. You know that? Two by fours and bricks don't talk back to you. But people do. And so in the first half of the book of Ezra, you find here God is, He has led His people 
to rebuild a temple, and now in the latter half of the book, he is rebuilding a people, the nation of Israel. And then when you get to the book of Nehemiah, they are building a wall. And they are continuing the work. So when you run from Ezra to Nehemiah, although those, those books are not very well traveled in our Bible reading, those usually aren't the first two books that we go to, there's a lot of great things that are happening. Amen. Now, with all of that said, tonight I want to look at Ezra chapter 9 as God is rebuilding a people... And I want you to see the marks of true confession. It's impossible for a people to draw nigh to God unless they have a broken and a contrite heart. And in, in chapter 9, we see the prayer of Ezra, which is basically a prayer of true confession. And tonight, I want to show you four marks of a true confession. You know, there are two words that are some of the most important words that you will ever hear or say. When these two words are said with great sincerity, relationships are mended, respect is restored, and great things happen. But when these two words are used insincerely, merely to appease somebody so that you might look good, and these two words that I'm about to mention are used just simply to get you out of trouble, listen, these two words make a mess. And here's those two words tonight. I'm sorry. You mark it down when somebody has a truly broken heart and those, they say those words, it can make all the difference in the world. Amen. But you take somebody who says it just because they want to get out of trouble and it does even greater damage. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you tonight before we read our text, that was a prayer that Israel needed to pray a long time ago. But I believe for many Christians tonight, that's a prayer that still needs to be prayed. Ezra chapter 9, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves, for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. Now, I want to stop there for just a moment. Before I give you the first characteristic of true confession, you need to understand what Israel has done. Now, God had made it very clear to the, Israel, to the people of Israel that He wanted them to marry within their nation. Now, we do find rare exceptions. Those exceptions would be, for the instance, Rahab the harlot, who was incorporated into the genealogical line of Jesus. Not only Rahab, but you also find others. Uh, Ruth yeah. is another one. So here's what you need to understand. When God gave that prohibition to the nation of Israel... It was not some matter of racial superiority. God wasn't saying, here is Israel and your race is better than the Jebusites and the Hittites and all of that crowd. But here's what God was trying to do. The Jebusites and the Hittites, they worshiped false gods. And it was not God's will for His people to be intermixed with idolatry. You understand that issue? It's not just merely a racial issue. We're just talking about here, the people of Israel are supposed to be worshiping Jehovah, and if you go marrying this crowd, and by the way, when you hear Hittites, Jebusites, Moabites, you know, remember when Joshua went and conquered the land, he had to conquer a whole bunch of people? Those were the people. They knew not God. They knew not Jehovah. And so what had happened 
is the nation of Israel let down that guard, and even the chiefest of the Israels, the Israelites, they reached across that border and they married into those pagan cultures, and now you have a mixed multitude. Now, this isn't the crux of the message tonight, and I realize that all the younger people are probably over in the next uh, the other building. But you know, that same principle, I believe, is carried over in the New Testament when the Bible gives a command to not be unequally yoked. Amen. And it's amazing how the nation of Israel, they simply looked and they lusted and they consumed of their own lust, and now they are in a mess. Yes, the temple has been rebuilt, but now there's work to be done in the hearts of those Israelites. And with all of that being said, I want you to see four characteristics tonight of what I believe true confession is. Number one, and by the way, these are not in order of importance. The thing I love about being a preacher is when you just take it as God gives it, you know, I just leave it up to Him, right? And I'm not going to say that the first one is the most important, but I believe that all of these have a part in marks of true confession. Number one, as you see in verses 3 and 4, outward distress. Notice with me in verse 3, the Bible says, And when I heard this thing, I rent or I tore my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished and then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had, carried, had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. In verses 3 and 4, you find an outward reaction. You, If I could say it this way, you see body language that tells the story. Now, before I go any further tonight, please understand, outward distress can be mocked. How many of us are imitated and be insincere? How many of us, when we were getting a, a whipping when we were kids... Uh, we knew how to turn on the tears, and it looked like there was a lot of outward distress, and we were just simply trying to get out of it. You know what I mean? Uh, there's one honest person here tonight. <laughs> but I will tell you this evening, I do believe that when God convicts in a heart in a mighty way, you'll see a body language that depicts it. And here was an outward distress. He was so grieved that he tore his garments and he plucked the hair out of his head. Now, I'm not saying tonight in order for you to be truly repentant that you need to mimic all of these things, but I will tell you, when God gets a hold of your heart, He can shake you up. Amen. And you not only find Ezra himself being affected, but notice in verse 4, Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled. What did they tremble at? Did they tremble at the anger of Ezra? Did they tremble at the consequences of sin? No, look what it says. They trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Do you know what caused them to shake? Do you know what caused them to be unsettled? They remembered what God had said. And it affected them outwardly. Do you remember when you were a kid and your parents laid down the law? And sometimes, if my dad was a very strict disciplinarian. And there'd be times that he would forbid me to do something. And I would find myself near the proximity of doing that thing that he said not to. And the thought would occur to me and say, you know what? I, I think I'd like to do this. And then I remembered what he told me. And I said, I don't think I'd like to do this. Or sometimes you crossed that line and then once you did you remembered what you were told. I'm definitely not against excitement in our churches. I've been in some places before where I thought a holy grunt would be a great improvement. But as much as we probably need enthusiasm in our churches and as much as we maybe need an extra amen here or there, I'll tell you that perhaps the greatest need tonight is for the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts in such a way that we are outwardly affected by it. When we can rediscover tears and sometimes just old-fashioned fear 
I believe that's the need of the hour in our country. Amen. When there's true confession, number one, you find outward distress. Again, that can be manufactured. That can be imitated. But I'll tell you what, when God really is at work and there's convicting, there are tears and there are trembling and there are hanging heads. It does affect you outwardly. But number two tonight, I want you to see not only outward distress, but another mark of true confession is humility. Verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, having rent my garment and my mantle, and I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. You know, this was not a show. This was not some kind of, you know, sometimes in church, and I'm not saying that everybody who does something publicly is doing it for show, but doubtless there are some people when they're in a crowd of people and they do something, it's for show sometimes. The Pharisees had that problem and we do too. But this man was so convicted and he was really more of in a national sense. I don't believe that Ezra had done all of these things, but he was so overwhelmed at the condition of his country that instead of pointing fingers, instead of raging at God, he humbled himself. Right now, I know there's a lot of things that are going on in our country, and it's really easy to point fingers. I, you know, it was probably like three years ago. It was the first time in my life I ever had to stop watching the news before Easter because it had just ruined, it wrecked me. I was like, I, I need to celebrate the resurrection. All I can think about is the mess that's going on in our country. You know, in spite of who's in the White House or who's leading Congress and all of that, listen to me. What would happen if God's people stopped finger pointing and just humbled themselves before God? Ezra, in order to move this nation towards God, he sets the example and he humbles himself. He pries, he lays down before God, just like Job did. When Job got the news that all of his children had died, listen, instead of being angry at God, he came, went to the ground and he worshiped. He fell down on his face and worshiped God. I just do. I do think there's something to an individual getting down on their knees or sometimes falling just before God just flat out. I realize I'm talking to some of you tonight and you say, Brother, if I get down on my knees, I'm not getting up. I understand. <laughs> we have a, prof a former professor at the college who's now he's 93 years old this week. I think his birthday was this week. And when, during the last part of his tenure at the school, we'd get down in prayer meetings and we would pray. We pray every Wednesday as a faculty, uh, faculty men. We get together and we pray about needs. And Ernest Childs is his name, who's written several of the devotional books that are available on the back table. Uh, Brother Childs came to me one day with a little bit of embarrassment, and he said, Brother, I can't kneel down anymore because if I do, I can't get back up. And I said, Listen, I'm okay with that. The Lord knows. I'm sure you're kneeling in your heart. But I will tell you, there, there, I do think there is something to when a person just slows down and gets on his knees before God or gets on... I think it's a real... It's an it's a act of humility. Yes, sir. It's hard to be proud when you're on your face. Right. Boy, it's hard to be proud when you're on your knees. Yes, sir. And if there's anything this nation needed, and Ezra set the example for it, is they needed humility. Instead of saying, well, we just wanted to do whatever we wanted to do, and so be it. Instead of that, they needed to be on their faces before God. You can't have true confession without humility. Amen. I remember years ago at Ambassador when I was the dean of men in the dean of students' office. That was a great experience for me. I remember that we had a real hot-headed student from the state of West Virginia. Now, not all West Virginians are like that. But uh, this one was, he had a very hot head. I remember one time he got into an altercation. This is many years ago. He got into altercation with some fella and almost gouged his eyes out. 
And I remember when he was being rebuked for that, I was this first guy and the only guy that I ever saw stood up in the dean of students' office and stand over the dean of students with his finger out telling that dean of students what he was going to do. Needless to say, that was his last semester, and I, I didn't see him for many years until probably, it was probably a good 15 years later. In comes a man with a cane feeling his way around and his wife and daughter with him. And when I met this guy 15 years later, he was a totally different person. He sat down in my office and I called him by name. I said, brother, what happened to you? He said, I lost my sight. I said, how did you lose it? He said, well, he said, after I left Ambassador, he said, I went to another Bible college thinking that when you change your location, it changes your character. And he said, the same hothead that I had here, I had there. And he said, one night I was out somewhere and my hothead got me into a mess. And he said, a gang of fellows whipped up on me and one person hit me in the head and it caused me to lose my, my eyesight. But he said, that was a turning point in my life. And you know what I witnessed that day? I witnessed a young man who used to burn with anger. But God put his hand on him in such a way that it humbled him. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, if that young man was standing before you tonight, he would say, I wish I would have humbled myself rather than God having to humble me. And my friend, true confession demands humility. It'll change your life. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Ezra had outward distress. Ezra had humility. Number, verse number six, number three, Ezra had embarrassment. Verse number six, he said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Basically, Ezra said, I am ashamed. He was embarrassed by their sin. Now, too often, when it comes to embarrassment and sin, we treat it all the wrong way. You say, what do, I, what do you mean? Sometimes if a child does something and the parent gets embarrassed by that child and then disciplines that, ch- that child, not out of love, but out of embarrassment. Now, that's wrong. If you just discipline somebody just because you're embarrassed of them and love's not your true motivation, you're going to come down heavy-handed and you're really trying to make yourself look good. That's the bottom line. Yep. Right. Now, I know we don't like to talk about that. But in spite of that misuse or that misapplication of the idea of embarrassment, I believe tonight that when it comes to sin in our own lives... When we are convicted by the Spirit of God, that we will experience embarrassment. And we'll blush and say, I can't believe I did that. You know, I've watched some people, they just confess to get out of it, but some of the most genuine confessions that I have ever seen or perhaps have ever displayed in my own life was when I was just so embarrassed, I knew better. And I thought to myself, Lord, I am so ashamed of how I have disobeyed you and the effect that it's had on your testimony. True confession doesn't lead you to be so self-centered of, oh, it's just made my my testimony look so horrible. No, it, it causes you to see how you've hurt God and others around you, and you're just ashamed of yourself. And 
And I may be talking to some here tonight. Maybe you say, Brother Beal, there's some things in my life right now. I do have a great sense of shame and a great sense of embarrassment. Well, I'll tell you, there is a way forward. It's called, He that confesseth his sin and forsaketh it shall have mercy. Amen. You may have to go through a season in which you're embarrassed. But if you'll draw nigh to God, listen to me, he'll draw nigh to you. But really, in our country today, we've lacked a sense of embarrassment. Things that are so proclaimed so openly, that are so clearly against the Word of God. And it may not be politically correct to say that it's sin, but the Bible is still true. That's right, preacher. Amen. But ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that some of the acceptance of those popular sins, if I could say it that way, in our society have crept into the church. Yes, sir. Amen. When it comes to matters of same-sex marriage and gender identity, listen, that ought to cause the child of God to blush. Amen. We ought to feel greatly uncomfortable with it. We ought to tremble at the words of God rather than the words of man. Amen. And I think sometimes we Christians, I understand, we look at our country and we wave our finger and we talk about how that this country continues to, to go away from God. And it's a rightful observation. I believe that every day it's like we just move another step away from the Lord. But what would happen if we Christians just gained a sense of embarrassment and said, Lord, when we see what's happening in this country and we see you, Lord, we blush to think about it. Oh, God, please help us. And there may be some tonight, there's some in this room this evening, there's something in your life tonight that's pressing and you know that you're shaming the Lord and you know that it is pulling you down and you say, boy, I feel that embarrassment Remember what I told you. You confess your sin and forsake it. You'll have mercy. Amen. But the last mark of true confession that I'll share with you this evening is that of guilt. In verse 7, it says, Since the days of our fathers have we been in this great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have our kings and our priests have delivered into the hand, been delivered into the, the kings of the land to the sword, to captivity, to a spoil, to confusion of face as it is this day. Notice verse 10. And now, O God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. When I'm talking to you about guilt tonight, I'm not talking to you about get guilt so much as a feeling, as much as a legal standing, if I can say it that way. First time I ever was in a courtroom as the object of the court was the only time, and that was in traffic court when I was 16 or 17 years old. Scared to death, appearing before a judge the first time, and they said, say guilty, not guilty, or continuance. I knew what guilty and not guilty meant. Continuance, I didn't know what that meant, but I do now since I've had a little, not personal experience with it, but I've, I've learned the legal terms. But when the lady asked me that, I only knew one thing to say. That was guilty. I was going 70 and a 55. There was no disputing it. And when I said the word guilty, if I could say it this way, I owned it. Well, that guy in front of me, he was just, he was speeding up and slowing down, speeding up and slowing down. So I just said, I just got to speed really fast to get by him. No, I didn't do that. And I've been in that situation before. Well, I was just in a hurry. I was going to be late to my in law to my, my girlfriend's house at that time. That wouldn't have cut the mustard. I think the best thing I could do that day was just say guilty. And can I tell you, I'm glad I did. Because when I walked in, 
And that judge who I'd never met before, who was wearing a robe that had great deals of authority, he questioned me about what I did. I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And after a good lecture from the judge, he said, all right. He said, I'm going to reduce that so it doesn't go on your insurance. But you do it again, and you're going to wish you had now. I said, yes, sir. When I'm talking about guilt, I'm talking about the fact that Ezra didn't make any excuses. Ezra basically said, God, here's our trespass, and we've been involved in it from the highest to the lowest, and there's nothing I can say. <laughs> I'll tell you, one word that's ruined many a confession is the word but. <laughs> but... You know, if anybody could have used that word, it probably would have been Ezra. But Lord, I'm not like these bunch of yahoos. But Lord, I, I didn't do this. And Lord, I, I, I wasn't involved in it as much as... No, he looked around and just as a whole, as his people, he said, Lord, this is where we're at. And in a sense, he owned it. Sometimes we as Christians, when we're living in sin, we walk around telling everybody not guilty when our conscience is screaming guilty. You want a true confession tonight? You say, Lord, this is what I've done, and this is the extent that we've done it, and Lord, there's not a thing I can say I'm wrong. I want to end tonight by just reminding you of one of the, what I believe one of the most powerful examples of confession is, and that's David. You're here tonight and you say, I don't need any confession. I'm a perfect Christian. David was a man after God's own heart and he fell horribly. And any person in this room to think they're beyond confession, I'll tell you what, you've deceived yourself. David acted on the lust and the impulses of his flesh and he kept covering his sin and it drove him deeper and deeper into a mess. And one day a prophet comes to him. You know, it's bad sometimes when the preacher comes to your house. And the prophet tells a story and David's liking that story until he hears the application of it. Basically, the prophet tells David, David, you're the offender. David, you're the one God's trying to ring your bell. And do you know when you read in the book of Psalms, there are at least three Psalms that talk about David's confession. Psalm 32, Psalm 38, and Psalm 51. In Psalm 32, David is very clear that it's his, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. He made it clear. He owned it. He said, God, I, I, I've done wrong. In Psalm 38, he said in verse 18, for I will be sorry for my sin. He knew that there had to be a deep brokenness in his soul. And you know what he said in Psalm 51? He said this in the point of his confession. He said, for a broken and contrite heart thou will not despise. Amen. You say it brings me to the point of tears. That's all right. A little crying's not going to keep God away from you. Amen. You say tonight, I am ashamed at what I have done and the shame that I have brought upon God and others around me. I can't believe I did that. What was I thinking? A broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. Amen. You know, Ezra prayed a prayer thousands of years ago. It wouldn't hurt us today to recapture the spirit of it. Yes, sir. Amen. And I believe that if we're going to see great revival, it has to be preceded by great confession. What are we willing to do? Let's bow our heads together in prayer.